<laughs> okay, we ready to rock and roll? We're yep. calling the meeting to order at 6 o'clock. Um, amendments to the agenda. Uh, in number 7 slot, we're going to put B as a revised warning that Mary Beth will talk about, and C will become the FY21 budget recommendations. We will not be voting on the recommendations this, tonight. Um, and then in 10, we will be removing the student matter executive session comments and only having personnel and contractual executive so session. So with the leading A? Yes. Okay. Does anybody have any other amendments to the agenda? Let's knock reflection down to two minutes. Okay, reflection can be two minutes. <laughs> Um, I also want to remind everybody in the audience that you have two minutes to state why you're here and your comments. It will be time tonight. We have a really full agenda that we need to discuss at great length. So I just appreciate your cooperation and your input as well. Um, so welcome. Hello, everyone. Hello. Standing room only. Great. Um, who wants to go first? Nobody's here to talk. <laughs> All right. Nobody wants to go. I'm going to move on. Oh, that's a hand. <laughs> All right. Okay, here we go. We've got um, two minutes. Sam, she's our timer tonight. Should I just walk around the exterior? <laughs> You're wasting your time. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here we go. Um, okay. um, introduce yourself. Okay. Tell you where you're from. Okay. So that Raina can put this into the mix. Okay, great. Okay, hi everybody. I'm Larissa Siegel. I'm in living in Woodstock, Vermont, and I'm one of the internal medicine physicians here at the clinic. So I just have like a quick little blurb, and then the slightly longer blurb. Um, first of all, thanks to all of you guys for your commitment and dedication to making sure that our children receive the best possible education. Thank you. Um, so as I said, I'm an internal medicine physician here in Woodstock at the Adequiti Salt Health Center where we serve about 3,000 adults. Um, so that's not including the kids who we serve, um, and that's including communities that surround the area. Um, and so whether counseling a patient about a chronic illness like diabetes or high blood pressure or advising a patient as to how best to stay healthy, lifestyle changes including nutrition have been proven to be the primary and most effective action, and that's including medications that we can prescribe, um, a person can make to increase their longevity. Every day I cancel patients to eat a healthy diet full of fresh fruits and vegetables and whole grains, and if our children can learn this when they're in school, then I'll probably be out of a job, um, and it would be a huge benefit to our society in terms of medical costs and improved work efficiencies. So um, tonight, um, myself and um, other people are bringing forward a petition, which we've had signed by community members, so I'm just going to speak briefly about that. Late last week, it came to the community's attention that our current district food services program was being asked to make budget cuts, and further, that the program might be at risk for being replaced by an outsourced for-profit food provider by putting the food services for the district back out to bid. In 2018, the Food Services Committee, as I'm sure you are all well aware, tasked by the school board considered outside food vendors for a school district. After extensive research, that committee unanimously recommended a district-run program to be based on then proven programs started years earlier at West. This program focuses on locally sourced whole food ingredients, scratch-made food, and includes an element of food equation that none of the external providers were prepared to offer. Now it is in its second year, and our current food program is providing all the children in our district with nutritious food, as well as education regarding healthy food choices, sources, and impacts, and in so doing, a way that supports local farmers and the economy. The current food program is an asset for the entire district, one that should be nurtured and promoted. We ask the board to consider an ongoing commitment to the current food program of at least three to five years to allow it to fully develop. This in-house food program would be very difficult to restart if we allow its positive trajectory to be interrupted. 
with support from the school board and my community. Just, yeah, the Windsor stuff. Supervisory <laughs> Union can become a leader in school food programs, one that is looked to by others for direction and inspiration. Um, given the recent changes in the WCUD financial director and the potential legislative changes coming in our state's government, which I can speak to anybody about later, um, supports for the school food programs in our state, we ask the board to stop considering outside food providers for at least the next several years. Please give your full support, including support from the financial director and the food services committee as an advisory board to our current food services program. And so just over the past four days, we've collected signatures from the community in support of this program, um, including more than 100 signatures from community members in Woodstock, Reading, Plymouth, Pomfret, Killington, and Bridgewater, and I'll submit those for the record. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yes, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Sam Siegel. I'm uh, related to the previous speaker. Many of you know me. I have uh, children in the elementary school. I'm an alumni of high school. And um, I served on the Food Service Advisory Committee that actually made the selection um, between the for profit food companies that we considered and taking the in house West program and enlarging it to become a district wide program. So I'm going to read a letter to you uh, from those of us who were on that committee who found out about this potential situation in time to get together and um, I'd like to submit that letter as well afterwards. So dear CUD board members, the Food Service Advisory Committee respectfully submits this letter in support of support in favor of the food service program and strongly urges the board to adopt the food service director's recommendations. These recommendations include one, adopt a five year commitment to the current program based on financial 2020 baseline data. Um, we don't believe that previous data is usable, I'll get to that in a minute, um, to guide the <coughs> program development. Support the food service director with more consistent check-ins with the finance director. Bring program recommendations and questions directly to the food service director. Move school nutrition program and employee health costs out of the food service budget to show direct cost operating the food service program, labor, food supplies, equipment as the food service budget. Periodically, come and join us for a meal. We, I go to the cafeteria at West routinely, probably three, Fridays a, week, a month, um, it's great food. You'll get a real sense of what's happening there and how the kids benefit from this program, and you'll learn that the whole community can benefit. I see a lot of parents there. Um, and then help us develop solutions to the food service, uh, substitute staffing issues for FU21. It's um, always hard to get substitute staff in the kitchen. Um, in 2019, the board, with full support of the community and school administration, adopted this food service program. The reasons were simple, and this is based on our conversation at the committee. Um, outside vendors were unable to provide the same level of commitment to high quality, nutritious food largely because they depend on pre-made heat and serve meals that contain more fats, salts, sugars, and the preservatives. Outside vendors were unable to coordinate nutrition and educational programming beyond meal service delivery. Outside vendors did not have a track record of reaching the majority of the student population. Outside vendors did not provide WCUD transparency on program costs, nutritional content, food, and local purchasing. Outside vendors were not able to provide the same wage. I'm sorry? Oh, oh I'm sorry, I thought you had a question. Um, Outside vendors were not able to provide the same wage and health benefits to employees, which would have created union issues with existing food service staff. An independent program would provide WCD an opportunity to fundraise and access grants and leverage food service program um, because it offered enhanced learning opportunities and local nutritious food offerings. So those are keys in order to get those grants. Um, as part of this agreement, the board requested that the WCD finance director and a newly created food service program advisory committee work closely with the new food service program director to ensure the program's financial health. As of the spring of 2019, the finance director and food service program director were confident that the food service program was meeting projected targets and stopped meeting. What we did not realize then was that the, much of the financial information used to budget projected program operations was inaccurate and that the way in which meals purchased and um, FRL, uh, federally reimbursable lunch reimbursements, were being tracked was highly inconsistent across the district, essentially setting the program up to fall short of financial expectations. Fortunately, our food service director has put in new protocols and is tracking the budget more effectively, which is why FY 2020 should be considered a baseline year in building a five-year program roadmap that the food service program can be benchmarked against. The food service program has been successful in meeting intended nutritional goals, increasing the percentage of the local food served, and improving systems for tracking meals, supporting and training staff, and managing FL reimbursements. A grant of $25,000 was secured to support New food and agricultural programming built around our food service program, school gardens and agriculture department, and the partnership with the National Park. Another grant application for $200,000 in support of food systems curriculum development was submitted for review on January 31. Almost yeah. done. Yep. Okay. It is our sincere hope that this board will continue to prioritize student health and nutrition by supporting the food service director's recommendations. Taking control of our food service program demonstrates the leadership of this board 
to fulfill its commitment to the strategic plan of for graduate guidelines that we will all agree to excel towards. Um, okay. And that's signed by Professor Osama. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Just say, you Um, hello, my name is Rebecca Williams. I um, have signatures from over a hundred members of the community to submit to the board. And I um, also am an international board cert certified lactation consultant and a registered nurse. I care deeply about our children's nutritional intake from birth through adulthood. I feel that the school lunch program provides our children with nutritious foods that feed their bodies and their minds. As a mother of three children who eat the lunches, it is amazing to hear that they get excited to go to school for what is served, being served at lunch every day. Uh, we moved to the area in 2019. When we were touring the schools, we were delighted to see that there's actually salad greens as part of the lunch offerings. We came from a school district where our children were being served essentially cardboard pizza and french fries. We are so thankful that the school district actually provides foods of many colors and of the rainbow is what we talk about with our children all the time and that food that feeds them, not only their bodies, but helps them to learn throughout their time, which is helps our teachers as well. Please continue to support the Farm to School Lunch Program and our children's bodies and their nutritious needs so that they can be fully engaged in learning and becoming good citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Back here. Okay. Yep. Okay. Sure. Okay. Um, my comment is a little bit more general, just about um, making a revision to the budget. I understand the complication of trying to draft a budget um, and getting state numbers and all of that. Um, uh, presumably, the original budget that was approved was developed based on primarily student need. Uh, also, you know, considering taxpayers, but primarily student need. Um, a $200,000 revision is not in consideration of student needs. It's wholly in consideration of uh, tax ta uh, taxpayers. And again, I understand that there may be a need for that, but $200,000, that's a, that's a, seems like a, a, a big price to pay. I'm, I'm grateful to hear that there's been a reconsideration of the horticulture program. It's disheartening to, to see that um, a behavioral consultant is the replacement for a guidance counselor, a point two guidance counselor at Reading Elementary School. And there's also uh, consideration of cutting our um, administrative assistant. Uh, it's a bare bones uh, building as it is. Um, so, and, and just a side comment because I have to add this, that all the sparkly promises that Act 46 gave us with, you know, consolidating and we're seeing nothing but tax hikes and cuts as opposed to tax cuts and opportunities. Um, so I guess what I'm asking the board is, you know, a, a big ask to reconsider the revision uh, completely. But if you can't consider the revision completely, at least in part, and primarily that you um, make the revision equitable among uh, throughout all of the campuses. I know it can't be equal, but a little bit more equitable, like maybe on a per pupil percentage. Thank you. Hi, I'm Julie Sluka. I am um, also here to talk about Reading Elementary. I. You know, I read the, I'm really excited to hear about the revisions um, to the budget. You know, I, very, I was very vocal last year about the, the significant impact this redesign had on our school and the, the constant cuts. I mean, our school was literally halved. And this is amidst a history of promises that we view to be um, pretty significant on the district's part that were never really quite fulfilled for us. And I, I found that these revisions were um, <laughs> really almost insult to injury. And I appreciate how hard budgets are and how difficult it is to make things balanced out. But our school is little, and it only 
I can't even imagine that it has five, if that percent of the total budget of the district. And to ask us to shoulder more than 12 or 13 percent of the total budget cut to the 200,000, in particular, the support staff that we need. I mean, we are a bare bones school. We only have a couple of teachers. There's only Sherry uh, Hatt, who is our support staff, as a backup. My child was seriously injured at school because of the heavy school doors this year. And if Sherry hadn't been there, there would have been no one to help Mrs. B address the fact that my child was seriously injured and needed immediate care. We don't have a school nurse. We don't have any backup. We don't have people in the rooms. We don't have extra staff. We don't have extra anything. So to further cut our school to get 20 or $30,000 of, of savings is actually a really huge impact on our school. And I've said this a million times, our long range planning needs to have a solid base. And it's not elementary school, like one or two schools that we're investing all of our time and money in. We have a really good range of schools. And if we broaden and create a robust range of schools, you're more likely to attract people because families come to a community, they invest in the school, you spend a lot of time talking about building a $68 million school, which would be great for the 500 high school students we have, but you can't cut the arteries that feed students into that school. And the arteries are the elementary schools. And to continue to cut the elementary schools that aren't, you know, in Woodstock or in Killington, I think is short-sighted in terms of the long-range planning. I, I really want you to reconsider the importance of it. I can't tell you how important it is having one extra body in that office to call, to address children who are sick, to address children who are hurt. You know, we have two part-time principals that are being consolidated into one full-time principal, and the full-time principal is not as experienced, but he's really good, which means he's also not as expensive. So I think there are a lot of savings that could happen besides cutting more staff out of an already like skeleton crew in our school. And I really hope that you consider building a robust like portfolio of elementary schools to feed the high school and middle school that you want to invest in. And that's uh, my pitch. Please <laughs> don't cut any more staff from our school. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, dear WCUD school um, board members. What? Oh, I am Gretchen Chai. I am the food service director of the district. Um, this letter is to express support for the current and future operations of the WCUD school nutrition program. Once again, there are discussions on the table that include sending the food program out to bid, which means the possibility of outsourcing the program to a private for profit company for FY 2022. The current school nutrition program is an asset to our district and is meeting the program goals by serving healthy meals to the children and staff of our schools. Mm -hmm. The program prioritizes healthy foods that meet USDA procurement re regulations and meal pattern requirements. It needs to be noted that the board unanimously approved the WCUD school nutrition program proposal over the private companies on June 11, 2018, and since then the program has been positively received and is thriving. Data has been presented to the finance committee that shows a flawed bid budgeting analysis and inaccurate <coughs> accounting up until October 2019. We are just now understanding the true cost of the program and are, and are now able to analyze and improve financial accountability. Um, I have prepared for you an extensive report that uh, outlines all of our operations, so I um, have a pile of them and I will bring them up and you can read them later. But um, please read the attached comprehensive food service report and ask questions for clarity. It is premature to express negative opinions regarding the program and how it might be too expensive to operate. It is my recommendation that the board adopts a minimum five-year commitment to our current food program based on FY20 baseline data to guide budgeting and program development. I also encourage the board to learn the full scope and complexity of state and federal regulations so that you can fully understand how our food program operates before entering in the rigorous and time-consuming bid process this fall. Last school year, our school nutrition program professionals planned, prepped, served 96,599 student and adult lunches and 18,908 student and adult breakfasts. This is no small task considering this was the first year of a newly formed unified program. 
Our families and community members look to you to prioritize student health throughout the district. Maintaining control over food quality and investing in this program as part of the, part of the greater strategic planning communicates to our families that you care about what a child consumes during the school day and that healthy nourishment does help support academic success. Thank you. And can you hand that off to Raina, please, Gretchen? <laughs> Have we said that we were only going to allow like 10, 15 minutes of the beginning? No, we meeting? told people two minutes two, per person. I'll hear everybody if they want to speak. Okay, I have my hand up as a No, you assistant. are not. I'm a citizen. Jim, don't start this. Anybody else in the audience like to speak? Oh, hi. I'm down here. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm Sam Powers, student. Sam, Hi. you better bring some humor to this one. Yeah, I just wanted to provide a little levity. It seems a little tense. I don't know if anyone's picked up on that. Um, <laughs> um, I just have something fun to report. Uh, today, uh, the leading women voters came to our school and uh, we registered 40 kids, which is beating the yeah. yeah. So yeah, that actually beat the statewide record, I think, uh, of 36 uh, from Montpelier. So yeah, I just wanted to mention that. So, yeah. Thank you. Anyone else? Nobody wants to follow that. Really quickly on the food aspect. Um, I'm Erica, I'm a senior. Um, I experienced the old food program. I was part of the development committee that um, voted and passed along to you guys the proposal to have Gretchen take on this in district um, food service plan. And I'd just like to say that I come to school wanting to eat food. I look at the menu and I look at them and say, Mom, don't buy me lunch. I'll eat that. I'm really excited. And I didn't have that experience before. So, I'd just like to say that it is worth our money, and that it's really amazing. It's okay, Erica, take it from me. Thank you, Erica. Anyone else? <coughs> Okay, we're going to move on. Superintendent's report, please. Good evening. You have the superintendent's report in front of you. Uh, a couple of things that I wanted to call to your attention. One item that is not in there, um, because I just had finished collecting feedback, um, but one of the things that we have been working on, as many of you know, Hannah Tyne, who is the principal of Barnard Academy, is retiring at the end of the school year. Um, and so we have been looking to figure out the best way to staff our administrators in our district. Um, John Hansen spent several days up at Barnard Academy talking with parents, with teachers, with students, and then we sent, I sent out a feedback form and the response was very, very strong. Um, I, I believe that the average response was nine out of a possible ten for being a really good fit at Barnard Academy. Um, no one indicated anything less than an eight. Um, so I, what I am intending to do is to move John Hansen over to Barnard Academy as principal of that elementary school. Um, and then what we would do is set up a, a feedback mechanism this week um, to get feedback from the Reading community about moving Cody Tancredi into the principal position there. He has um, been finishing up his licensure. He has been doing a lot of his um, practicum hours at Reading. Um, my, my feedback that I've been getting more <coughs> anecdotally is that it's been very well received by the Reading community. And um, so I think it will be helpful for everybody oftentimes when it, there's lack of clarity around what administration is going to look like for the year, um, being able to get this all put together 
um, by the end of the week, hopefully, um, will be something that will help everybody feel good about where we're headed and give some clarity to, to the issues there. Um, a couple of other things in the superintendent's report. Um, one of the things that we will be moving forward with um, next year is what's called the SAT School Day Program. Um, so starting next year, um, we will be having all students in the 11th grade take the SAT exam. Um, and we see two potential benefits to this. One is that it gives every student an SAT score so that no longer is an obstacle for any child that decides that they would like to move forward with application to a post-secondary institution. And the second thing is it gives us a, a source of data for our revenue graders. Um, our SBAC only goes up to ninth grade, so this will be a, a, a data point that will enable us to see how um, we're doing right up to the 11th grade. Um, the next piece that you have in your booklet is um, a really, I think, exciting teacher leadership um, event that we have as an in-service. We have many of our teachers in our district that have stepped forward during our in-service day on March 2nd to lead courses and workshops for their colleagues. So they will be presenting um, and um, we are coming together collaboratively to hear what one another is working on. All of our teachers are engaged in action research projects, so they're going to be sharing the, um, their findings and how their, their research is going and looking for connections between the different projects that are happening. Um, I'd like to congratulate and thank Jennifer Staten, who has been putting a tremendous amount of work into making sure that this event is a, is a strong one for teachers. Um, and I'll also just very quickly mention that there are some meta studies um, by a gentleman by the name of Dr. John Hattie who looks at what are the most impactful things that school districts can do for student at first for improving student outcomes. And the number one element at this point is, is called teacher efficacy, which means that teachers are, are engaged in thinking about the work that they're doing. They're, they're, they believe that they can make a change for kids. They look at collecting data for the impact of that, and that really reinforces that what we do matters and we can change student outcomes. I think a lot of, you may have heard that from one of the coaches in an earlier meeting about the first time they, they taught through a particular word study, X amount of students had, had received mastery. They went right, they looked at the data, they made some adjustments, and each time they did that, they moved more and more students towards mastery. So these kinds of high level professional conversations are really critical and valuable to our, to our organization. And again, I, I really want to publicly thank Jennifer Staten um, for the mastermind behind this and for all the teachers that stepped up to lead workshops for their colleagues. Um, Is it one for, for pre-K through 12? It's pre-K through 12. There's about, in your book, you have a link to all the different sessions that are being offered. There are some sessions that are designated more for, you know, the elementary grade levels, primary grade levels. There are some that are appropriate for K uh, all, all different grade levels, so teachers will have an opportunity to choose which sessions they would like to go to. Um, finally, in this report, um, or actually two more shouts out. One, I'd like to um, recognize Sherry Souza for her work um, in the area of special education, but also moving her team to be leaders in the state. Um, and we are, we are now working with Castleton University to offer a, um, a special education accreditation program here at WCSU. The classes will be offered um, here at the central office on the weekends. They will be taught by a remarkably talented <coughs> special education um, department. So we are becoming that kind of destination for professional development that we're looking to build. Um, and on a, a positive note related to budget, that we are anticipating that this, our participation in this project will raise uh, approximately thirty to $60,000 in revenue 
for the district that is certainly very helpful um, in these tight budgetary times. Again, I'd, I'd like to publicly recognize the efforts of Sherry Souza. She is remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, One more thing, then we'll move on. Um, I did want to mention that we have an amazing group of students from Dartmouth College that are um, partnering with the, us for the Senior Design Challenge, and they are working um, to help us with the externship experience for teachers. That is part of our strategic plan. So there's a team of Dartmouth students that are here on site and going off building out and um, recommending programs and strategies for ways that we can um, start to offer our teaching staff um, externship experiences that keep them deeply connected to um, the community and businesses and organizations. Mary Beth, on the page three, okay. the district enrollment. This is what I was looking for. I'd like to ask if we can make a few other um, updates to it. Sure. Especially since there are a lot of, the, we increasing, we decreasing where, but since Reading only has up to the fourth grade, mm -hmm. or third grade, um, I'd like to see how many students in fourth, fifth, and sixth are actually attempting to wear, or whatever, that are actually Reading students. Mm -hmm. So that would be on equal showing us what the full school is, because now we have policies for closure and we have policies for reopening, so it would be nice to see what the student count is in, in that town. And if possible, um, on 7th grade through 12th, if we can just get some type of um, number for each town that go over to the high school from which, which town they're in. We're, I mean, we are based, th this whole budget is based Believe it or not, on just one number, it's how many students we have, and we need to know where they're coming from. Thank you. Mary Beth, I'll just echo your words about Cody Tancredi. I think the school and the community uh, is very enthusiastic about continuing to work with them and the opportunity to work with them more. We'll, we'll schedule another meeting um, later this week. We'll be meeting weekly on the budget. So we'll um, see what happens tonight, what questions are brought up, and then we'll meet again. So be on the lookout. And thank you for, I appreciate, um, you know, there's the budget, the finance committee, but I appreciate other board members coming a lot. It's, it's very helpful, and um, if you have the time, please, please come. Tim came to the last one too, Patty's been coming. Really appreciate it more hands and more ideas, the better. So um, we'll be talking later about the, the budget. Building the grounds? Um, nothing new to report until okay. we finalize the budget and then we'll go for it. <laughs> okay. Campus configuration? Nothing new. Communication? Um, not too much new going on. Um, I do want to give a little shout out to Joe. Is Joe here? Yes. For, um, you know, he led weekly <coughs> tours November, December, and January that were very well attended. And Joe, thank you so much for doing that. I think it meant a lot to the community. We're going to continue to do them, but not weekly. Um, but I just, I feel like we owe him a round of applause. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we are going to um, send out information to educate the community about the Barnard vote that will come up um, at town meetings um, and that we will do after break at the recommendation of the Barnard community. Um, I think I mentioned last week we're working on a photo shoot for district-wide um, materials and that should happen after February break. 
Um, we've also been talking a lot about how to get more community feedback and perhaps how we can use the thought exchange tool in order to accomplish that goal, both for things around the building project, the budget process. Um, so we're going to continue to work um, together to figure out how we can engage everyone. And just a shout out to everyone, too, for coming out tonight and sharing your thoughts and concerns. We think it's really important and, and lovely to see so many concerned citizens here tonight. Um, and if there are other things that you think of where you would like additional communication or ways we can um, interact more with the communities, please reach out to our community, the CEC at WCSU.net. And, um, and we would love your thoughts. Um, and then I mentioned last time that there was a request for community members to um, put a video out of Joe's tour, and I know Jen is going to work on a storyboard for that. Oh. And what am I forgetting? Jen, are you going to have to Okay. Okay. Um, you have no more comments on finance? Hiring committee? We uh, tried to have a meeting, it was canceled by Mother Nature. Yeah. <laughs> they got it together. I think we have a schedule set in the morning our meetings, but unfortunately we were set to meet and we got snowed out and the school was canceled. That's the end of our report picture. <laughs> <laughs> Negotiations committee, um, we are working to confirm dates to start meeting with the support staff. And I'm in conversation with the teachers to start that conversation as well. Um, so it's really just finding the timing that works for both parties involved. New build? Yeah, we've got a lot of materials in the board packages, <coughs> um, really for the purpose of promoting transparency of new building activities. Um, I'll try to make this relatively brief. Mary Beth, you can put some, some slides up for us. <coughs> We got an update from the Valley Brenzinger Architects last week and just wanted to provide some of the slides that they um, presented to um, the, uh, the subcommittee at that point uh, and kind of give a, uh, an insight into you know, what they've been up to, what we're paying them to do. Um, and you know, at this point, we're in phase one. We may remember uh, when we voted to move forward with uh, kind of the, um, uh, the next uh, you know, portion of design services. Um, the idea around uh, phase one is really to determine is it really possible to do what it is that they've um, they told us in the spring that they we might do, and that is you know put a new building essentially where the football field is. And there's a lot of questions that raises. So what we've got going on right now is um, a couple of different categories of engineers. First, the uh, the, the geo borings, and then also uh, a, a civil engineer uh, with uh, particular emphasis on you know some of the regulatory aspects of, of uh, what it is to have a, a school uh, site that's next so close to a river. Right? We'll see some slides here, but this uh, these are some of the considerations that they're working on uh, currently on the civil engineering um, uh, aspect. Um, one update from the the, uh, the geotechnical engineer with the borings. They actually were able to, to get on. Um, to some places where they uh, wouldn't be able to because of the, the snow days that we had. And so far, so good. Um, the updates show that we've got um, a very uh, firm um, you know, site, both close to the building, the parking lot, and most recently over by the football field, there appears to be a, a glacial layer um, that was apparently put down at some point um, that uh, you know, provides a very uh, firm uh, basis. They'll need to write up a report, but the initial reports is that um, that's, a, that's a, a pretty good site. Um, if we want to go to the next uh, slide, um, from a, the site planning update, uh, really what we, we uh, the, from the uh, work that Lavalle Brenton here did in the spring, um, and when we met, you know, um, within the last uh, six weeks or so, these are really the, the things that they undertook to do, right? Getting a more compact footprint for the building, um, not getting any closer to the river, making sure we're avoiding impact to the school, um, this whole concept of these neighborhood houses for the new school building is preserved and then allowing for expansion. We want to right size the facility and not um, you know, over invest up front, but be able in case we do see an influx enrollment to expand. Next slide please. So this is the, uh, the site uh, and as you can, the, the outline on the right is the current building for anybody who can see it. Um, and the idea is, as you can see that pink um, you know, blob there on the slide is where the new building would go. And the idea, and this is pretty fine print, you might have to see it in the, in the board package, is to maintain that 270 foot distance from the river. There's a lot of 
kind of environmental um, implications to that. And then the river corridor, um, we've got a, a meeting with the state this week. They'll be out to walk the site um, to uh, get some inputs on you know, some of the, um, the, the regulatory aspects. Get the next slide. So um, uh, LBA, I'll call the architects LBA from here on, um, you know, met with a group of the faculty to talk about um, you know, some of the, the, the programmatic aspects. Um, we're, we've got some materials after this uh, that uh, kind of focus on the decision to add the sixth grade to the facility. Um, that's going to ultimately need to be a, um, uh, a board decision according to you know, uh, district configuration policies, but for planning purposes, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at incorporating the sixth grade into the uh, middle school. And you can see some of the things that they did uh, kind of on the right sizing of the, the building from what we saw in the spring. A lot of things were kind of taken out um, and, uh, you know, getting some, uh, you know, kind of a compacting of the, um, of the building. So you want to keep going? Uh, and so this is what we came up with. The sixth grade integration was achieved by keeping the, the same uh, kind of footprint of the building which uh, brings down the you know, per student, uh, per, uh, you know, student per square, uh, square foot per student number, which is important for you know, state approval processes. Uh, that's come down to 232 square feet. I don't know what the prior was, but that's um, within a, a range of, of what's comparable to other new high school projects. And then creating this distinct middle school and high school. All right, that's all pretty boring. Um, if you want to go to the next one, just by comparison, here's what we saw in the spring for the facility. And as you can see, you've got this concept of the houses with the you know seventh and eighth grades there on the left, and the humanities, the STEM. This is the, the main level of the building, the double gym. If we go to the next slide, you can see kind of <coughs> this revised version, right? A lot more compact. You've uh, added the um, the sixth grade. Where are we? Um, eighth. So seventh, eighth. And where's our sixth grade? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, over on the left, the sixth, seventh, and eighth, the middle school, they're kind of a distinct experience. And then, you know, um, maintain the, the STEM and the humanity stuff on the, on the first floor. Uh, this is the original um, kind of upper level of the building that we saw, you know, library um, over the entrance, innovation lab kind of over the, the uh, back of the facility looking out over the river. And if you go to the next slide, you can see um, a little bit more uh, dense, you know, compacting of that with a lot of uh, kind of space that's taken out. So that's what they've been working on. Um, uh, this was just, sorry, there's an update on the, the overall program, the phases. This is uh, phase one. Just wanted to provide that. There's also a bunch of materials in the book, and Bob, I don't know if you wanted to, to touch on this over kind of the sixth grade decision. I don't know how much time we need to spend on that. There's some history in the board packet around uh, some of the votes that were taken on the prior uh, configuration committee to investigate um, the, the decision to include the sixth I grade. That, I think that would be really helpful to have particularly a more extended conversation about. Sure. We're looking at two of the campus configuration committee members that this is news that you know this decision has been moving is moving forward, right? Mm -hmm. So I think there needs to be more kind of conversation. With yeah, the, which is the reason why we're bringing it for the full right. board, right? We don't want this to be some kind of star chamber, um, you know, where we're making decisions, um, you know, that, that uh, you know that aren't endorsed by the board. Um, so. In my communication, it was at least you know very bad. Just out the word that this this was something that came out of the committee originally as a recommendation was never taken up by the board. So as I'd say, it still exists in the my my observation is still in the jurisdiction of the committee, in terms of the, you know, the, with the new policy in place, how we how we play this out in terms of in terms of formally making a decision about six grade. It, it, to me, I'm just a bit baffled because for now we're looking at images of a campus that now includes sixth grade, whereas two weeks ago we weren't talking about this. So. I, I, I'm just, I just want to point that out, that this is a big jump for me. I don't know if others are noticing that as well. I think, I think what the assumption here was, for design purposes, the architect couldn't move forward unless it was an initial decision made for purposes of the design exercise. And obviously, the decision about sixth grade has not been made. And I mean, is this the sort of thing that you know, really looks like that sixth grade is a to the pod or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, so One of the houses. If the decision is made by this board that we're not moving sixth grade over, that pod we go back. be taken away. Yeah. Yeah. So but, uh, but they seem to have, you know, right-sized or compacted um, common areas and taken out certain things. 
So, but is that sixth grade sort of like that's a standalone that depending on the decision that the board makes at whatever point um, that can be taken out? Yeah, I don't think it's that simple. I mean, the programmatic yeah, yeah, aspects of kind of play out over the whole um, facility. Yeah. So, if the board decides to you know, uh, go in that direction, then we have to go back to the architect and say, okay, looks like that's not where we want to go. We're going to need an update. Okay. This is one of the reasons why we need all the other information first before we continue to talk exactly what's in the interior exterior of the building. We need to know what we can build on this piece of property first. I would not bring up any discussions at this point of 6, 7, 10, 12. I don't care if it's college kids. Pre -K, pre -K. It's, we need to find out. My interest is, is one, the Act 250, the traffic, all the stuff that we were told was going to be in phase one of this project. And then also, where do we stand with the state right now getting this as approved as a um, going forward so we are not in the penalty phase on for this year. Those are, the, those are the two things right there. The civil engineering paperwork for the state, Act 250, the river, all that kind of stuff there, plus from the state. <coughs> if we start talking about any classrooms in here right now, I mean, until we have that other stuff, there's no sense of even having those discussions. That's how it works. I mean, I'm with you that I sat through the meeting that one day that we had with the architect or whatever, and it was left as is that, you know, we'll look at sixth grade being in here, but to be honest with you, at that point it was um, a building that was only going to um, fit 500 children, 600 children with the same square footage. So um, hopefully, when this moves a little bit further, that you know that it can be built on here, that you go to the Adams group and you get their input so they can come back to us because that is their that is their, that that is their sub subcommittee or committee, whatever you want to call it. Well, I would also think that although I I understand what you're saying, I think that discussion has moved to this new committee though too, what, what the new is? campus configuration. I mean, the discussion of the sixth grade. It's, it's, it's Adam and Patty. Get it. No, I, I'm addressing what you said before, that you think that decision, you know, was with the old, um, whatever, previous whatever, committee. the mean, previous committee. You didn't know. That. No, it, no. It, it was with the previous it's committee, and it stayed with the new configuration. I think it should, yeah, I think it should stay there. Yeah. yeah, and our intent here is not to, you know, make that a fait accompli. You know, we really want to be transparent. Uh, it came up in, you know, when Lee was providing the presentation, the architect, Mary Beth raised the issue, say, no, nope, we need the, the full board to you know, be cognizant of the fact that we're talking about, you know, uh, a, a movement to sixth grade into the facility. So that's the <coughs> purpose. So, so, ben, thank you. First, I think it's a, it's a really good report. I say, you know, we kind of run between these two things. If we don't present it, uh, people say we're not being transparent, right? If we do present it, people say we're out of our skis, right? right. I mean, so it's kind of you're, you're stuck in the middle. Right? It's, it's, you completely understand that. But at the end of the day, I think it's good because it does drive the conversation of campus configuration, which we need to have. And it does continue to drive the conversation of what's the site going to maintain. By no means do I view this as like the final, but I do think it's good that as you put this out there, it forces the rest of the board to consider what do we need to do to make something like this a reality. So I think that's a very good conversation to have. Thank you. Claire? Oh, I was just going to say it seems like um, having the information from the past configuration committee and the work that was done <coughs> is useful for you guys now just to sort of see what what conversations were had in the past so thank you for including that in the report. Bryce? I was going to say the same thing. I think that you know there's a lot put in this specifically the presentation of uh, Ryan Becker and Jen Stanton um, along with Sherry to kind of make that case um, and one reason I like having these committees separate is because I think it is two different conversations. So I think it's important that both, you know, two different committees are doing two different things, but there are completely different reasons because the main argument for making that shift um, was educational and social emotional. It wasn't related to the building. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's just an important point. Okay. On, I, I mean, I would reiterate that having heard those conversations, I mean, ha having that research and that work already done is going to be very helpful to us going forward. But we've also have layered on top of that now policy about, you know, sustainability and configuration that we're going to have to work into all of our campuses and how that transition is going to be made. So that I think is perfect. The hard work for us is going to be. Mm -hmm. Good. Mm -hmm.
the policy committee, do you want to just report when you're presenting the adoption? That's it. Okay. Um, so tonight for the consent agenda, uh, we are approving the minutes as well as, as accepting two resignations, one from Mr. Reed, who is an English teacher, and one from Mr. Harris, who is the agricultural lead um, teacher, and he's here tonight. Um, I just want to thank both individuals publicly for the outstanding job they've done in their positions and for their commitment to our students and our community um, and the foundations that they've built over the years within both those areas of focus. Uh, I will now make my comment as a chair. Mr. Hires and I have had a lot of conversations over the last week as well as many, many other people within the communities. Um, I've listened, I've heard. Um, there's a lot of passion and commitment that are attached to many of our programs, not just agriculture. Jennifer and I had a very long conversation on Saturday as to how we should move forward. Uh, on Sunday, I had a conversation with Mary Beth and we made the decision to keep that position within the budget for the next year so that we can transition to the best candidate moving forward and that candidate will come in and hopefully build on the foundations that are in place now and move it forward and expand it to something even more fabulous than it already is. Um, I've answered every email personally with that letter attached, which you've seen in the audience. Um, and that's where we're at. So thank you, Mr. Hires. I appreciate all of your input. Um, and there you go. So can I have a motion on the table for the consent agenda to be approved? So <laughs> Pick your people, Rand. <laughs> Um, any other questions about the consent agenda or any alterations that we need to make to it? Just like give a round of clap, clap for the people that are retiring. Yeah, I just also like to echo the, the sentiments that you've offered, Paige, and you've offered Jim, uh, both to John and to Tom. Uh, two fabulous educators that have offered so much to this district, have brought innovative programming, um, and we wish them the very best. Probably. But we are thrilled that they are moving on to an exciting new chapter of their lives, but we will miss them and the work that they've done. So You put that it in there. there. That, yep. you, that was your reason. No, that was all the. <laughs> okay, all so stuff. we don't need to repeat no, that. Okay, yeah. moving on to B, the revised warning. So, um, in the, the the ongoing exhaustion of technically getting things right. Um, we had an issue related to the warning that went out. Um, there was, in comparing, as we're getting ready to send it out to the newspaper, I took a look at what was sent last year and this year, and I grew increasingly concerned that the number that was in the budget was less this year than last year. In talking with Mike, he had felt that what we wanted to put forth in front of the voters was the actual tax rate, the number that the taxpayers would have to raise. What the number that actually had to be in there was the full budget, including the revenue. So this is a totally technical language change, but we want to get it right for our voters. Um, Rain has already posted the revised warning in different places, but what I need to now. Um, check in with the board is that the 
it, the, the warning is going to read that the school board is approving the school board to expend $21,783,948 um, which is the amount that the school board is determined to be necessary for the ensuing financial year and then um, 60 of which 60 million eight hundred ninety six thousand six dollars is to be funded by taxes so that's the number you voted last time because that's the number that's being generated in revenue but we have to actually put the the gross number that includes that includes the revenue in there. Does that make sense? Otherwise, we could receive title money, but we couldn't spend it, correct? Yeah, well, what would happen is we would run a major deficit because we wouldn't be including in all the revenue dollars. Um, so this way, we're saying the, the taxpayers are giving the district the authority to expend all of the tax revenues raised by the towns and the revenue dollars that come in. Does that make sense? Yeah, is it consistent with what we've done in past years? Is that how we've reported? This is how it's actually been, that's how we caught the error, is that this is actually what's been done in past years. Okay. Um, and so what we did do is just clarify so that people can see that the, the actual budget number has not changed at all, but here's the number to expend, here's the number to raise so that they'll see the connection. And I, I, wanted, I want everybody to know, I pre thank you very much for picking up on this. Mary Beth picked up on this, thank you. It is the type of thing that when we put this warning up, it, it's it's really not anything. Had we missed it, it would be. So it is, um, we'll, we'll deal with it. It's a technical issue. Um, it doesn't change any numbers, but um, thank you for picking up on it so that we do this the right way. Okay, Jim? So in the past, what we used to do is it was revenue from the students, if district, uh, out of district students coming in mm -hmm. towards me. Plus the budget, and then when we had our vote on the month, the second Monday of the month, there was the SU budget. Mm -hmm. Are we having that vote on the SU budget? So that that this money is, the, is in there also. Yeah, that money's in there as well. So this is the the total budget it includes grants, it includes tuition. This is the the amount it costs to run the district. The money that is that is needing to be raised by the taxpayers is the money that you voted on last time. Again, that's that $16 million. So, so when we're voting on that, just so we can get information out to the people that are voting, it'd be really great in our information packet showing where the revenues are coming. Like most towns will say it's coming from the town clerk's office, it's coming from the list. It will mention the different areas. So we can have a breakout of what's coming from um, tuition students. Because once again, that's a big number that we're looking for when we're doing the budget. And then how much money we are expecting to get from um, federal aid and grants and everything. And we don't have to have it broken out each individual grant or whatever. It's the total base number that you think you're going to be getting. Just, I mean, we're voting on a budget of $16 million funded by taxpayers and another $5 million of other funds. And it would be nice to see how much of that other funds is from actually people choosing to come to our school for tuition. So we need a motion to accept the revised warning. <clears throat> so moved. Second. Any other conversation? All those in favor of the motion on the table say aye. 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 All those opposed, the motion is passed. Thank you. We need to sign this. I have the purging of sign. <clears throat> Don't forget to <clears throat> stop me. Um, okay, now that this is going to present the FY21 budget and we're going to review the recommendations that came to the Finance Committee. Um, that's it, you're on. I'm on. Okay, so when you first voted the budget, um, we did not have the um, finalized equalized people from the state. State did not get those numbers out until the Wednesday after the board took the vote, um, and and again this is challenging because our what puts us into penalty phase is the amount of the budget divided by the equalized people. So um, we had an emergency meeting last week to say in order to keep this district under the penalty phase, 
we would need to take additional monies out of the budget um, and to the tune of about two hundred thousand um, dollars. We spoke to pull the board together in the emergency meeting. The board voted to take the two hundred thousand dollars out of the budget. Um, but that more time was needed in order to determine what that would look like. Um, and so what, what I was charged to do was to come back and say, where do, you, where, does you, where do you and your administrative team see that the, you could tighten and pull this out of the budget, right? And so now we're not in a, we, we really have to look carefully about what are nice to haves and what are need to haves in this district, right? This was not um, something that we, we said these are surplus, nothing that we can't do without, um, but the, that there are some things in the budget that's, that are nice to have and where can we tighten up to get need to have. Um, what, so one of the things that I had shared in my memo to the board is that we spent about two years doing a strategic planning process and this is the moment at which that strategic planning process really comes into play and really helps because it gives us direction about what do we prioritize, how do we handle these difficult situations. Um, and what our strategic plan tells us, along with specific strategies that we want to support, but it also has what I would say embedded in it is a theory of action. And the theory of action is that if we engage in just cutting programs and cutting programs in difficult financial times, that is a losing proposition. That the, the way forward for this district is to look to become a destination district, to look to build the kind of um, school system that families are actively looking to be part of. Um, so that when, when we looked at what possible cuts um, and reductions could be made, they were, it was looked through the lens of um, how do we maintain um, critical programming in this district and continue to look to be um, the kind of district that people want to come to that, that is exceptional and different. Um, and um, more powerful potentially than other districts in the state of Vermont. Um, so with all that being said, um, the, the, the reductions were um, put forth. And um, one of the things I did want to be sure, because this budget has been a moving target, is in previous conversations there were two reductions that were um, a reduction in force, one is an elementary teaching position and one is a middle school, high school teaching position. Um, in, in both situations, that was, those, those reductions were made prior to that $200,000 cut, but just so that everybody can see and be sure that, that nobody missed the fact that that is occurring. Um, for both the elementary education position, um, that is that will be determined once we get through pre-K registration and school choice registration so we can look at numbers across the district and make a determination as to where that would best um, be taken from. And at the uh, middle school, high school, um, we, we have a retirement with an existing faculty member and we, we will be looking to backfill that with an existing person. Um, so at, at this point at the middle school, high school, we are not anticipating that it will be a RIF, that we will actually be moving some staffing around, um, depending on what happens at the elementary level. If we re receive a, a, a retirement or resignation, we would um, use that as the cut, um, but at this point that has not happened. Um, so that's what was prior to the $200,000 cut. Um, when we look at the 200,000, and one of the things that I, I, I see in the district and appreciate and understand how difficult it is, when you get here, there are wonderful things that happen everywhere, um, and yet doing nothing that you could make an argument for every single one, right? For why it would be helpful to have that. But at some point, there are some financial realities that we need to take a look at. So the first um, recommendation that we have, again, under the, the nice-to-haves, but not necessarily what we absolutely need to have, 
is to eliminate the summer hours from the administrative assistant position at West. Um, then to reduce the Reading Elementary Assistant position to a 0.5 at Reading. We are moving up the principal position there to be full time so that there will be a consistent person in the building um, each day um, so that we feel that that can be, that, that will work. Um, to, the initial recommendation was to eliminate the agriculture assistant position with the idea being that this was going to be kind of a, uh, a, a year to start to see where that program can evolve from, or evolve to, starting in a fabulous place. Um, and then this, is a, this is a really critical program for the district in terms of, des of destination. This idea of forestry, this idea of resilience and food, this idea of the agriculture program, all of these things, given where we are, um, uh, is something that we want, we see as a growth area. But we also want it to be as efficient as possible. Um, and so looking at ways in which we could increase efficiency while also having the program evolve, that, that appeared to be something that we could do. Um, again, nothing that anybody um, that is that we would voluntarily put forward, but in difficult budget times, that was something that seemed to make sense. Um, in talking about the food service, there were um, lots of challenges and lots of questions about other ways to tighten that up. And working closely with Gretchen, Gretchen again went through the budget, felt that. She may be able to move forward the middle school, high school, going down one cashier position so that that was um, taken out, um, but that there was no recommendation for um, uh, moving um, any changes in terms of the food purchasing. Um, then there was, we have a um, guidance uh, position at Reading Elementary School that serves two students. Um, and we have a trained person that visits that school on a weekly basis, so we feel that that person can pick up that particular service for students. Um, so that was a, a number of staffing reductions, and we had all those in front of you. Then we, there's a category called belt tightening, which is taking out overall PD travel line items of 5,000, reducing the overall supply line items. Reducing sub costs. Um, one of the things that we talked about was the ER day, um, and we think that we can bring down some of our sub costs as a result of that. Um, pulling out a line item that was in the West budget um, that, in speaking to the principal, she feels that 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 can be pulled out, um, somewhat of a remnant from the old model before the merger. Um, and that central office administration reductions would come in at about twenty thousand. Um, the other category had the and that's nothing. If you can just expand on on that, Mary Beth, that's there was a series of different types of reductions. So one example would be that there is a line item for communication okay. in central office. So we would pull that back. So this was that was one example, but it was a, a, a compilation of a number of different line items okay. that enabled us to get to okay. the twenty thousand. Um, then we had, there was a legacy um, administrator's cell phones at the middle school, high school. Not a, a large amount of money, but we, we reduced, we took that out for about 5000 And then um, kudos to Mike and Chessie who um, renegotiated our fuel oil contracts and picked up about $30,000 there, which was absolutely crazy because that didn't involve cutting anything but um, save the district a significant sum of money. So those were the reductions that were put forth that total $200,478. Um, I do want to add one thing that isn't included in here in the recommended uh, reduction when the finance committee met. Um, we had um, at the last round of cuts, um, cut the board stipends by whatever, 50 or 60 percent. We um, came at this uh, after um, meeting and, and we're going to make a recommendation <coughs> to, to zero that out. Um, to, uh, to, so there'd be no board stipends, so that would be um, 
I think we've left 15,000 in there. I think you're right. Yeah. 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 Um, then one of the other concerns that the, the finance committee has that I, I think is a very reasonable concern is the amount of money we actually have in our building and grounds funds um, to address um, different issues that may come up. Um, so right now there's about 170 prior, um, in the current budget there's about 177,000 um, in the buildings and grounds. Um, that you know, one major incident and that could cause a problem. Um, so Mary Beth, yeah. and that 177 is the 50,000 that we've pledged to offer. So there's only really 127. Right. I, I was actually. I, I, it's between. It's funded both for the buildings and grounds and for Prosper Valley. So there, as you recall, the board voted to look to support. $200,000 for Prosper Valley from a variety of funding sources, but one of them was 50000 from the board. So Jim is correct that within that 177, that 50000 would go to that. Um, and so one of the things that the, the Finance Committee asked for is what are other ways to raise that revenue? Um, there are a number of opportunities I see that would enable us to potentially direct more money to buildings and grounds. All of them are still a little bit tentative, so I was uncomfortable saying we can cut them, but they are opportunities to redirect funds to buildings and grounds. So very quickly around that, um, one opportunity is to open up a second pre-K at West if the numbers work. And I, I can talk very briefly about how that works. I have a short presentation for you on that. Um, we are currently looking to um, put into place at the middle school, high school, a school resource officer. That is a, a <coughs> position between a school district and a police department. Um, and what, what we are hoping to accomplish there is that if we get the grant, that position would be fully grant funded for three years. We had somebody um, retire in December that was dealing with a lot of behavioral <coughs> pieces related to the middle school. If we get that grant, we do not need to backfill that position. Um, so that could be 50000 um, Lots of creative thinking um, on the part of the Finance Committee around snowplow contracts. So it, if towns can pick up the snow plowing in our elementary schools, we can pull that out of the budget. So that's being negotiated at a number of different town, at, at, at the town level. Um, if that works out, that's another 24,000. Um, there is something related to um, our technology contracts called an E-rate grant. We anticipate we're gonna get it, but it wasn't guaranteed, so we didn't build it into the budget. If that grant comes through, that's another 10,000. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Sherry and her team is going to be starting this graduate program um, in, in partnership with Castleton, and we anticipate that that is going to be revenue generating for the district um, uh, to the tune, I think, conservatively at 30,000. And then our new new studio is part of our contract with them. Um, they provide some summer professional development that we can charge for, so we also see another revenue source there. So in total, if all those things were to come to pass, that would be about 233000 that could be redirected into the um, buildings and grounds fund. So those are the recommendations that, that I've put forth, um, and I would be happy to answer any questions related to that. I would also be happy if Ken allows to do a very brief primer around how pre-K works, because that can be confusing in terms of where those numbers come from, if that's something the board would like to see. Yeah. Thank you. Um, a couple questions, but yeah, I'll start with the pre-K question. Um, with the previous staffing reduction approval, with the 1FT elementary indicator um, to be determined based on pre-K needs, but if we do add another pre-K pre class, then that nulls that position being taken away. 
potentially the, the challenge that we have is related to licensure. We have very, very, very few, in fact, I'm going to say one person that um, has a pre-K license um, who is currently assigned, again, for a very strategic position. Um, so we'd, I think that we have to see how that played itself out. But the, the issue related to pre-K is that you need a very specific license in order to take on that role. So that 70000 is really a big if. Right? Well, the, the 70000 we would have to, we would have to, to riff a person mm -hmm. if there's no retirements or resignations. I can tell you that not that I have an extensive history here, but every year something has happened and we, we have gone down an elementary um, teacher or somebody has retired or resigned. And it's my understanding that that has been fairly typical over the course of time. So I remain hopeful that that will occur through attrition and not through actually having to do it. And then I have a different question unless somebody else has a question on Keep trucking. Keep trucking. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the point two guidance position at rest versus the behavioral consultant um, position. I'm just wondering if you can expand upon the difference between those positions, and I don't know how much you can talk about that, but um, how that looks at at Reading in terms of you know what what the difference is between those. Yeah, two. they're they're both um, individuals that are licensed to provide services in the social emotional realm. Mm -hmm. um, because there are so few students that need that, having so, a, a dedicated person even to come in for like a point two is a full day. Um, they may see students for an hour and then they're you know they're they're in the school and needing to be compensated for a half a day or a full day. Um, and we also have somebody that, again, has those skills that um, visits that school on a weekly basis that could provide those same level of services. Um, Sherry, anything that you want to add to that? No, yeah, their licensure is very similar um, and training, you know, pretty extensive on both part. But, um, and they've been in that, are familiar with the student population, in fact, works in every single building in the district. Can I just ask a question? What is their license? What are their actual uh, professions? So guidance counselor versus what? School social worker. So the course coursework is pretty similar. The the background. I I have other questions, <laughs> but I think they have to wait because they have to do with. Um, Thank you. Yes. Clark, um, I just have a question. Um, remind me the 200K for remediating Crosser Valley, so 50 of it. Can you just remind me what the breakdown 50 is? 50 came from us in the budget. Um, there was a private donation of 50 okay. today. Up to today. Today. To, to today. Up to today, yeah. Okay, so right now we have 100,000 of that 200 <coughs> Correct. Earmarked. Um, I'm all in favor of using that building. I think it's beautiful. I'm just trying to get advice about how to respond to people when they ask about cutting things um, that involve programming or schools where we have existing students um, in order to put more money at this time in a building where we don't currently have any students, so how how should that question be answered? Are you answering that for her? Well, as a finance group and as a full board, we made a decision some two years ago to completely look into um, Prosper Valley School mm -hmm. to bring it back to a working order. Okay, is there and, a time? And we're still we're still in that process, and right now we don't need. Not donated. We've allocated fifty thousand. We have somebody else that donated fifty thousand, mm -hmm. and we're looking for. And we, as a board, voted just two weeks ago to say that um, we will put up money from our budget, and we were looking for loans or for um, donations. So, if anyone was to ask me from Killington why are we putting money into Prosper Valley School, I would say because it's the board's direction, and we've allocated fifty thousand dollars. Okay. 
Right. I, I guess that that allocation was made before we knew about the additional 200000 No, the, 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 the commitment was made when we found ago. out about this problem two years okay. ago. Yeah. Some people may not have been on the board, but mm -hmm. when two years ago or two and a half years ago now, Patty, mm -hmm. when we found this issue out, like mm -hmm. two weeks before school started, uh, we made a commitment mm -hmm. now as a delight to, to, to look forward to. Thank you. Prospect Thank you. Well, I mean, you've all heard everything I've ever said um, so many times, but I mean, we have, we own the building. We have a commitment to fix the building. Mm -hmm. There's no way um, we could hand it back to the town not having done that. If this happened on our watch, um, you know, during, it's an incredibly unfortunate timing, of course, but you know, that community too, until we figure out what happens to the building, that it is fixed and it is sustainable and it is safe for students to go back into, you have a town that had a four-year non-closure commitment. You have a town that falls under, two towns who fall under our policies <coughs> of sustainability and, um, and reconfiguration. That's so those, very those, those, those people still exist. No, that's a really helpful answer to the time frame. was the question that was hard for me, not the fact that we need to do it. It was like, why now? You know, but that's actually really helpful. Cause that's really uh, yeah, I think I the think patience I mean, of people has been yeah, great and generous. And I think um, at the legislative level of town, I think patience may start to get thin. I don't, you know, that's word that comes down to me. And I think that's something we've become. Thanks, you to you explained that very eloquently. Bob? I would just add that at this point we've got a one-to-one -one leverage match. That's not bad. Correct. And hopefully we can improve on that. Yes. And also, you know, the reason why we're making these cuts is because we did not have a total of 913, which the budget was originally based on. Mm -hmm. We had 904 that was confirmed by the state. Mm -hmm. And the conversations with Jim and various people within the finance committee um, was where are those real numbers, where's the commitment from the state saying that it's 913. So on that Thursday, it came down, it's the real number is 904. That's why these cuts are having to happen, so that we don't go into penalty phase. If you go into penalty phase, every $50,000 50, $50, adds a penny to your tax rate. Every dollar that goes into penalty phase, you're penalized two dollars for every dollar. Jennifer and I have always made the rule, no matter what budget we create it, that you never go into penalty and phase. I mean, my my thought process behind that has always been there are the there are the actual ramifications of how much each extra dollar in penalty costs, but there's also I have always thought that thought process that the state sets what it believes to be a reasonable amount for a tax for a <coughs> district to expend for um, for educating each child. And I think it's our duty to really try and stick to something that is, you know, within that this the amount the state has set. I mean, they've taken and and that's the number they've taken into account. Larger cities, small towns. I mean, everybody has this same number to look at, you know. So I think it's, I think it's a good place. I've always thought to benchmark. What do we spend per kid? Well, this is what the state says is a reasonable amount, and over which they feel that it's excessive. So you know, that, that's been my philosophy. So Jennifer, on that number, I don't think a lot of people understand it. The state doesn't set that eighteen thousand seven fifty six as a number that they say is what should be spent. The state sets a number that's set by all the budgets in the state of Vermont, and there's an average. Yeah. And there, from there, they say that we will go at 130%. So we will add 30% to that state average, which gives you the higher number. So they're Thank saying you. the same thing that we've done, Lou, Pamela, and myself, in our um, policy meeting for our our number underneath uh, yeah. per school or whatever, and we went with the thirty percent. So, mm -hmm. it, it, and that's why we didn't want to use in policy the, the the state average. We used our average, and we used the same. Th I don't know, if they, but there was a reason for the thirty percent. Right. It was the used from the state. Okay, so so when you look, so when people start saying, well. You know, I'm a smaller school, and why can't I spend twenty thousand dollars? 
I mean, now you're at like 50%. If you go up that much higher, you can, you can be 35, 40, 50% if you keep on going over oh, the state, state average. average. So we have to keep that in mind. Um, yeah, I was just going to say is that you know, there was a um, budget committee member. Um, you, know, you guys had this policy in place for a long time, but you know, I guess the way I see it is you can ask taxpayers to pay more in taxes. Tax increases, I think, come uh, incrementally. Um, but to ask a taxpayer to pay more money and get nothing in return for it for the school district is too much. Yeah. Right? And that's essentially what penalty pays me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, kind of, I, what I'm trying to understand is the, the impact of continual, I mean, how many consecutive years of double-digit <clears throat> health care cost increase that we've seen? Three. Is, does that get factored into the change in that number? No. Well, only that, to the that, extent that there's that an that average amount no, that you spend, it, it does. does. It yeah. Yeah. Okay. It, gets, it gets factored <laughs> into our number, but the state doesn't does. factor in. It's because the state has that, 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 that percentage that. increase for health insurance is the same throughout the state, okay? And so it works into the average of running, what an average school runs, and then they add 30%. And then on top of it, I believe that our per pupil number that we divide into our cost went from 10,173 10, to 10,833. So you have to, I mean, you really have to dig into whoever's going to be taking over financing in two years from now, you've got to know these different numbers. And, and, and the state does move that number accordingly. And sometimes it's larger. This year it wasn't as large because most of the other schools didn't increase as much as we're doing. And the yield. The so, yield. Yeah, the yield. So, Bob, when, you, when we originally presented the budget, the combination of the health care premium increases, which were 13% this year, and our last year of contractual obligations to getting all teachers on the same grid was 75% when we first repeated, reported it. When our per pupil spend went down to the 904 from the 913, mm -hmm. it increased another 10% on the total increase in the budget. Mm -hmm. it's 85. Those so two it's factors are 85% of our increase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's 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 criminal what the insurance agencies are still charging year after year after year to see double digits. It really is. I mean. Something has to give, and the healthcare system may bankrupt the schools. And the healthcare system is bankrupt itself. Well, <laughs> then somebody's got to figure it out, and I don't have the patience, patience right now. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, one comment, you know, on the cuts, and I will say, Mary Beth, I appreciate the fact that these cuts have tried to avoid programmatic cuts for students, I think, as much as possible. And so, I, I appreciate that. I think it's important that, you know, that's kind of our last line. Um, I will also say, you know, being on this board now for three years and seeing this process, the fact that we don't get state numbers until after we're setting our budget or accurate state numbers absolutely floors me. And I certainly hope that changes. So if everybody wants to write more letters and do more petitions, there's a really good one, right? Really hard to set your budget when we don't know what the number is going to be. Uh, we're kind of shooting in the dark. So sometimes I think people will be critical of the board and say, why didn't you get it right? And I would say, because we didn't know what the number is. We need inputs. And so... I think this board's done as good a job as possible. These cuts are as reasonable as possible. I would ask you one question. Uh, Professional Education Services of West, can you go over again what that is? Yeah, I, I would identify that as kind of a carryover. It was a line item in the West budget that wasn't in other elementary school budgets. Um, and it was actually a catch when we met with our leadership team that that was something that did not need to be in there. Um, and that I confirmed with Maggie that she does not use that line item again just to carry over from when this was a standalone school. And I would expect as we get further and further into being a combined district with budgets, all these things get cleaned up. We're we, really we strong were, progress. And yeah. I expect in three years we'll be much better. Than <coughs> but yeah, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, I was late. Did food come up at all? <laughs> Yeah, you miss the good stuff here. Yeah. You want us to leave and go to the other room? And you <laughs>
what I have to say is probably been covered, so. Um, and just to remind you all, we are going to go into exec executive session to talk more deeply about the personnel and contractual ramifications of some of these suggestions. Um, I just want to add on the other possible revenue side, the snowplow contracts already, I believe, Redding, Barnard, and Killington have agreed to not charge for plowing. That's true, right? So the $24,000 left is... Woodstock Elementary School is the only town where the town has never plowed our back parking lot over the last 23 years. Um, over the last three years, when we became part of Act 46, they took away the funding for the generator, stating that they were no longer responsible for it, and $160,000 came out of that budget line item. Um, it would be really nice if Woodstock would rethink their process and help us out a little bit, because that's a big line item for us, $24,000 a year for plowing. Um, but we have to go to the select board to ask them. And the new uh, town manager, I think, comes in in March. That's right. And, so and that's just that tiny little back parking it's, lot. It's this and the back parking this lot. This and the back parking lot. So Woodstock traditionally has paid for this as well. This, this parking lot yeah. is so fifty thousand. This is fifty. Yeah. This is fifty, yeah, and the elementary, only the elementary school is twenty-four thousand. Okay, so it so, is only twenty. Yeah. So while we're the tiny little parking lot's twenty-four grand. I think that's no, it's, a combination it's, it's, of all. Well, we're not going to we're not going to get into what the contract. No, I, I'm just yeah, but I'm just saying that seems like a lot for thirteen thousand, thirteen fourteen. 13, it's, 14. it's 13, 14 for the elementary school. Okay. Okay. And that's so, but, but so where we were going with in finance was is we like to ask, and I believe this 24 is probably for total snow removal because Killington does, Killington, the town of Killington, I know for a fact, since I sit on the select board, we go in and we plow. But we are not shoveling the sidewalks or we not whatever. So this 24,000 is including probably some type of other snow removal over there. We do uh, that, the 13,000, 14,000 included snow removal in the parking lot. Our guys take care of the sidewalks. Right, okay. So what, what I'm trying to do is get people to understand if we are a unified district and we need to pull together as one, okay, these are things that we're able to move to a town and in the long run your total tax dollar amount will come down. Okay, if each town says whoever has an elementary school open, we will take care of our elementary school. I want to take this further and say that the Woodstock High School is also plowed, but it's out to contract. And to be fair here, that it's not just Woodstock paying for it. We break it out how many people are in each town, and then each town that is responsible for that share going towards. So it's fifty thousand dollars, and there's only fifty kids. Let's say, okay, we're not down that low. We're just using it for quick math. <laughs> All right, it's a thousand dollars per pupil. And if there's ten kids at Killington, then Killington pays ten thousand to the contract. What's the middle school high school? So wow. fifty here. Yeah, fifty-four last year. Fifty-four, 54 last yeah. year. So I want to make it that we are a district and <coughs> we take care Special. of as a whole, mm -hmm. not just putting <coughs> one to one. Excuse me. So I think that's something we need to be talking about for the future. And we'll wait for the new town manager and hit every single select board up. Um, I don't get too deep in the weeds and I don't need an answer necessarily now, but um, I don't know if other towns besides Woodstock, or if the numbers we're referring to included not paying for the emergency shelter usage. I know Woodstock pulled the, the, the money that they would have normally paid to the school after the merger um, to that. And I'm just not sure if other towns did or not. Again, I don't know if we know the answer, but um, just something else along those lines. Killington lines. still continues. The town of Killington still maintains, because we put a $70,000 machine um, over in Killington Elementary School. And back when we did that, like seven or eight years ago, it was, we were, they were looking to make 35000 from the school and 35000 from the town. I sat on the board at that point, and was, we realized that we were only affecting taxes to go higher. So the town took the full seventy thousand dollars. So and we are still maintaining and in our right of way, we 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 maintain it right away for that to be an emergency shelter and we do maintain that building. 
I'm hoping any other town will do the same. I can't control other towns, but if you can get to your well, people and, and, so the, and, and the put the roads up. the town of Woodstock, the select board, took away the monies and did not inform the school board of that. And they also did not inform the public that they were no longer going to be using the school as an emergency shelter. It was news to them when I brought up that information in our last town meeting last year. Do you so have an, emergen an alternate emergency shelter? It supposedly is in now White River Junction. <laughs> if your roads get closed, you'll have a bridge going to get to White River. <laughs> <laughs> So if you want to do another <laughs> sign thing to go to select board members, why don't we do that as well? Chris Behar, is you're retiring, oh, right? Yeah. You got some time, you get some energy in this. <laughs> well, I appreciate your confidence. <laughs> <laughs> we right, did not open a can of worms, but I think it's relevant because if we know it's a lower cost, right, for towns yeah, to do certain yes. things, and after this merger, if I, and again, I didn't know if any other towns did or not, but it's, it's, a, it's not nothing when you're talking about a few hundred thousand dollars potentially total. We're not voting on this tonight. Um, let's go on to policy. We, we only got one event. in front of us tonight, Pamela. Yep. What are we okay. going to do? Okay, do we need a motion? <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's a motion to adopt. Yes, it's a motion to adopt inter district <laughs> school <laughs> choice um, policy, which is. Uh, Largely based on what we, how we've been doing it, um, but we just wanted to formalize it into policy, and then we also thought it should be one of the policies where we have procedure in the policy so that it's super clear for everybody. So there's no, there's no changes though to how it, how it's been practically working or anything. The only, no. the only difference here is if you would recall one day over at Woodstock Elementary <coughs> School when we had a parent coming, there was no policy in place to take it the next step. Yeah. So we made a policy. So the this, is, the, is, this is how we've been doing it. It's now just in a policy. Now it's now just a policy. Now it's just verbalized. So it's there. Gotcha. Verbalized. It's yeah. there, and we can follow the chain of command. That's does, it. Does that parent? find out that a change was made? Do you know? Well, it's not really a change. It's really just codifying what we're doing. Oh, okay. But we have a <laughs> He's been quiet. And still it just, I mean, it, there is, it still gives um, final approval to the superintendent, you know, based on, based on educational issues, building issues, whatever that might be. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. Clarifies that even further. Yeah. 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 So it's pretty much operationally the way we've been working, but it's really helpful. It's a policy now right that if a parent yeah. came in front of a superintendent and didn't like a decision, then we had a policy that we can go into a meeting and we can discuss. That's it. So, Dave, you're going to say you already said it? Motion to approve? She did not. Well, nobody, nobody made the motion. Nobody oh. made the motion. I did. Motion to accept the inter-district school <laughs> choice model. Second. Chairman. All those in favor, say aye. 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 <laughs> the motion is passed. Reflect. We only have two minutes. I would like to um, reflect. Sam, Sam, can you time this, please? Yes. It didn't work out so well the first time. You were, you were not. <laughs> you were timing, but we need to get you like a little You've got to have a bell, a, a cow I, bell. I, I think there's something wrong with your phone. No, I was I doing it. No, we need like an orange flash. Like I was doing it, I was just kind of being like this weird. She was being thing. subtle. <laughs> I was being subtle. I was trying not to be weird. Next time she's going to have a cowbell. Kind of like, okay, you're doing a good job. <laughs> Keep going. Reflections. <laughs> I think that was a good group of reflections. We all laughed. <laughs> Sam needs to be more efficient on that. Okay. Got that. That's her first time. Yeah. She actually called me. She did good. Anything else? 